What I want to do is to talk to you about effective pedagogy. I want to show you some ways to help engage your students and uh, help them to think about your topics and the areas of study and ways for you to bring them into what you are discussing. So we're going to use both of these index cards a few times during my session with you. So again, everyone needs one green card and one blue card. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do first of all with the blue card. Everyone take your blue card. And I want you to assume that this is the first day of a seminary class on teaching. This is the first day of the semester of a seminary class on teaching. You are excited because you are students and we're excited as professors because we're just getting started. And here's what I want you to write on your card. As you think about learning about teaching, as you think about being teachers and you think about being professors, if there were one question or one topic that you would want to make sure that gets covered in this class, so we have a whole semester to talk about teaching, if there's one topic or one question that you want to make sure that we cover, what would that topic be or what would that question be? So I'm going to take just a couple of minutes and just write down a question for me. I'm not going to ask you to read them to us uh, unless you wish to do that. I just want you to write something down. If there were one question, you would say, I want to make sure that we talk about this in this class, in a class on teaching, in a class on learning how to teach. What questions do you have? What one topic would you say, I want to make sure that we talk about this in this, in this term? All right, does everyone have a question or a topic? Here's what I want you to do. I would like some volunteers, just a few of you, just to tell me what is the topic that you would want to make sure that we talk about, or what's the one question? And we're not going to get to all these questions in this hour, but I'm trying to show you a method here. So who will tell us first, what's the one question or topic that you would definitely want to talk about? How to make sure the students understand the content of my lesson. Okay, how do we make sure, how do we find out whether or not students understand and comprehend the content of your, of your lectures? All right, good. How do we set objectives that are going to meet the needs of the students? Okay, so how do we set objectives that meet the needs of students? Let me hear two more. All right, what methods of presentation should I use? One more. Okay, how do I develop a lesson plan? All right, good. Now here's what I want you to think about. We come into the room as professors with content that we want to cover, with objectives that we know we need to meet because they're on our syllabus they are objectives that we turn in to our deans, to our creditors, and all of that's very important. But sometimes our students come into the room with questions that we had not thought about, with things that they want us to cover that we had not considered. It doesn't mean that we can cover everything, but if I'm doing this in, in one of my classes, and I do this particularly in a higher education class, uh, we look at this together, and I look at, I take these cards up, or sometimes I will just do this verbally with a class if it's smaller, but I will take these cards up and I will look at all of the questions and all of the topics and I'll begin to check off. Now I know we're going to cover this, I know we're going to cover this. If many students in my class say, I want to make sure that we get to this topic, then that says to me, I need to figure out how to get that into my class because I want to be answering the questions that they are asking. And I can't know those questions until I ask them what they are. So starting the class that way allows us to get a sense of what they bring into the classroom. Now I'm aware that 
in this room, I'm talking to educators, so you know content in general, so you know what kinds of questions to ask. Sometimes students won't even know what question to ask yet, and all they can tell you is, I don't even know enough to ask the question. And that's helpful to know too, because you now know something more about the students that you are teaching. It's just a simple methodology that takes just a couple of minutes, and it tells you a lot about your students from day one. Now, let's talk about effective pedagogy. And I want to give you some presuppositions that, that I bring to this as we talk about how to do this. Here's my first presupposition. We've said this all along. I do make the presupposition that theological education is discipleship. It's not the entirety of discipleship. We partner with the local church where discipleship is centered. But I do think our task is to make sure that we are helping to produce men and women who walk with the Lord and who know how to reproduce themselves by making disciples and teaching themselves. Thus, thus for me, this task of teaching assumes that there is one growing Christian who is teaching other Christians how to grow and grow others. That means for us as professors, it is not enough for us to reach some level of expertise and grow stagnant, either in our knowledge of our discipline or in our walk with God. For us to be effective professors, effective teachers, I would contend that you and I must be growing in our walk with Christ. And we must be growing in the knowledge of our discipline. One of my fears is that we spend more time talking about growing in our discipline and less time talking about growing in our walk with God. And I want us to walk with God in this way. Here's the, here's the image that, that I think about. If a student walks with me 24 hours a day for the next week. And I know he's going to live with me, he's going to live with my family, and he's going to see everything that we do, and he's going to watch everything that I watch, and he's going to hear every word that I say, and he's going to listen to everything that I listen to, and he's going to see every place I go on my computer, and he sees how I treat my wife and how I raise my children and how I respond at my church. If he sees everything about me for the next week nonstop, and I know he's coming to do that with me, would I change anything simply because he's there? And if I have to change a lot because I have a student watching me, that usually says to me, I've got some room for growth in my walk with God. I don't want us to have to change the way we talk or change the jokes that we tell or change the things that we watch because students that we want to respect us are watching our lives. I want us to live in such a way that whatever they see they can respect and they can trust. Because this we know. Whether we know it or not, they are watching us, aren't they? They are paying attention to our life. And so I want us to be disciples of Jesus who are making disciples of Jesus. That means we must pay attention to our own walk with God. And we're helping them to be followers of Christ, to know what it means to be followers of Christ, and to do the work of being followers of Christ. It's that essence of being, knowing, and doing. So my first pre presupposition is this is discipleship. Here's a second presupposition. Our job is not to impress. It is to teach. Our job is not to impress. It is to teach. Now, I've, I admit that I may be speaking only of a problem that I sometimes see in Western culture. But it seems to me that sometimes academics struggle with pride. I don't know if you face that or not, but I think sometimes 
we wrestle with arrogance. And if our students are impressed by us and not by the Jesus to whom we're supposed to be directing them, we will have missed the point of our work. And we're to teach in such a way that our students will be used of God to do greater things than we have ever done. That ought to be our goal, that God will take those that we teach and he will use them in greater ways than he has ever used us. It is, it is, in my opinion, to teach so that students learn. Now, let me illustrate that. Suppose you have a room of 12 students, and you teach them throughout the semester, and three of them just get it. And they understand, and they comprehend, and they're, they're picking it up, and they're giving it to others. They're teaching well, and we rejoice at that. You have nine more students who really don't get it. Something's just not connecting. I know some professors who almost brag about the failure rate of their students because their classes are so hard. And I want to caution against that. Because our job as educators is to teach, and if we're teaching, it is our job to get students to learn. Now, I'm not arguing that we will reach all of them. Jesus had 12 in his immediate group, and one of them never got it. The others wrestled with it most of the time. But a good teacher does not brag about student failure. He or she figures out how to reach those students. And often that means for us that we may have to say to them, are you not listening? And sometimes we have to figure out why are they not listening? What's going on in their life that, that's getting in the way of their hearing and understanding? And sometimes that means we have to step back and say that perhaps the problem isn't my student. If nine students out of my 12 don't get it, it may be that I need to rethink my approach. As effective pedagogy, ask the question, are my students learning what I want them to learn? And it seems to me, if anybody ought to think this way, it ought to be theological educators. Because we're training men and women to do the greatest work of the world. And we're sending them out with the greatest message there is. We want them to get that right. We want them to do well in our classes. We want them to be effective ministers of the gospel. And that means our job is not to worry about whether or not we impress with our knowledge or we have big classes or our books sell well. Our job is to teach students and to help them learn because what we're teaching matters. All right, you with me there? That's the second presupposition. Here's, here's the third one. Now, I'm going to give you this, and please give me an opportunity to explain it, especially because we've talked about the significance of curriculum today, and I'm completely on board with what we heard our sisters say. But here's my third presupposition. We do not teach curriculum. We teach people. We do not teach curriculum. We teach people. Now, I know that curriculum matters. Content matters. And I think we have to lay in there. Content matters. If we're teaching people to obey everything that Jesus commanded, we can't teach them to do that unless we teach them what Jesus commanded and help them understand what Jesus taught. And so we have to deal with content. We have to deal with curriculum. We work very hard to create curriculum and to to require the best curriculum we can require to produce the best graduates that we can produce. And we heard even today the importance of reviewing curriculum over and over and over again to make sure that we're, we're doing this right. And I agree with that completely, but, but I want us to make sure that we keep in mind we're not teaching material, we are teaching people. And, and here's how I see the difference. Let me, just, let me just illustrate it this way. If we focus on teaching just curriculum, our goal will be to finish the material. 
if we recognize that we're teaching people, our goal will be to teach the material to produce followers of Jesus. And that's different. If we teach only curriculum, one of the reasons we tend toward lecturing is not just because that's the way most of us were taught, but another reason we tend toward lecturing is because we're teaching curriculum that we think we have to finish. And it's easier to get it all done if I'm doing the only talking. But if we're teaching people, we're willing to step back and ask, are you understanding what I'm teaching? And do I need to back up and reteach? Do I need to do what Jesus did and say, all right, let me tell you what that meant. Let's make sure that you're grabbing this. If we're only teaching curriculum, we will study our material. But if we recognize that we teach people, we will study our students and our material. We'll learn about the people in the room. We'll learn about what they're living with and having to deal with and what their ministries are like. And yes, we will want to get content to them, but we'll recognize that to get content to them means that we have some understanding of who they are. If we teach just curriculum, we will focus on the classroom. Because teaching curriculum means you come to the classroom, we have material to cover, and we give it to you, and you walk out. But if we recognize that we're teaching people, we'll still deal with material, but we will think about the student not only in our classroom, but also in his church, and also on the mission field, and also in his family, and wherever God may send him. We'll be thinking about how do I help equip you to do whatever God has called you to do wherever God may send you. And that's different than just focusing on the classroom. Then, finally, if we teach just curriculum, if all we think about is, I've got to get through my material, students are a means to an end. They, they allow us to show off our giftedness and to enjoy our jobs because we like teaching, and we like teaching when there are people in the room listening to us and but if we just teach curriculum, they're there to let us do our job. When we're teaching people, particularly in our work, they are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's a different perspective. We still have content to cover. We still have curriculum to, to, to achieve. And all of that we still have to do. But, but I want us to keep in mind that we're not teaching curriculum. We're teaching people. And that means we have to know them. We have to spend time with them. And that becomes increasingly difficult with new delivery systems. While I, would, while I would still argue that we can do that via online education, I would argue strongly that, because we're facing that much in, in North America. It is much, much, much harder to do. You have to put much more energy into it to make it happen. And yet I would argue that regardless of the delivery system, good educators figure out how do I get to know the people that I'm teaching. So there are my presuppositions. Let's, let's review them just a minute. My first presupposition is what? Theological education is what? You tell me. It's discipleship. Number two, our job is not to impress. It is to do what? Good. And third, we do not teach curriculum. We teach people. All right. Now, let me pause there for just a minute. We've, we've just been talking together for 20 minutes or so. I want a couple of you to tell me what has already most caught your attention or most stretched your thinking or something that you've written down that you're thinking, I need to think about this some more. I want to hear just some immediate feedback to what we've done thus far in this in this hour. Okay. In particular, that education is discipleship? Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. For me, it's the, the don't teach, teach love. It's teach 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Two more. Yes, you may. Okay. Okay. Curriculum matters, but we teach people. The fact that we need to study both our curriculum and the students. Okay. Okay. And some of this, part of what we're doing, particularly for training people to go across the nation, across the boundaries, across the seas, we're sending them out to other people groups, we're going to say to them, you have to get to know the people. So do we. We model some of that when we get to know our students at some level. Now again, I will say to you, this is not easy. It's not easy with different delivery systems. It is not easy as our classes get larger. I teach classes with, with no, dozens of people. And part of what I have to do is to decide I can't get to know every one of them. But I can get to know some of them. All right, so I'm just asking you to think through what, what grabs your attention, what might you want to think about beyond our time together right now. That's intentional. I'm going to come back to that in just a little bit. Now, those are my presuppositions. From there, I want to think about some strategies. I've been a seminary professor for 20, almost 23 years now, teaching with some of the finest teachers I've ever met anywhere in two different institutions. Some phenomenal scholars. Let me tell you what I, what I sense is probably the weakest part of seminary teaching. It's not content. It's not content. We have scholars who are incredible scholars that can match their, their, their intelligence and their wisdom with anybody. I think we struggle sometimes with helping our students apply what we're teaching them. I appreciate it today when Zane opened the word for us and, and brought us back to not just, not just expositing the word, but he left us with questions that dug into our heart a little bit and forced us to think through, what am I going to do with this? I'm, I'm not just sitting here listening because it's the morning of this conference and someone's supposed to preach. He took it from the word into our heart to say, you got to decide what are you going to do with this? I think we have to help our students do that. And so I, I want to give you some ways to at least think about effective pedagogy, just some ideas. And I don't argue that these are the best. I don't argue that these would all necessarily work in your context. I'll, I'll let you figure that out. But I at least want to give you some ideas. Here's number one. Learn to ask questions before you answer them. Learn to ask questions before you answer them. And the reason I say that is because when you ask questions before you've already answered them and you push your students to give you some kind of response, you get greater insight into what they are already thinking. Because anytime we're teaching, we're adding material to what they already know, and many times we are trying to dislodge what they already believe, right? Even for believers, sometimes we've, we've heard it all throughout this conference of some are still dealing with syncretism, and, and they're reverting back to old patterns, and Part of what we're trying to do is to help them change that way of thinking. But in order for us to best do that, sometimes we may need to find out what are they thinking. And so I think, for example, if, if I'm teaching a lesson on the ordinances, I might start with a question like this. Does it matter if the method of baptism is immersion? And it's just a simple question. Does it matter 
if the method of baptism is immersion. And I might back up even to say, let me make sure that I explain what we mean by immersion, because I don't want to assume that students even understand the term. But all I've done is asked a question, does it matter? And what I might do in handling that question, I might, for example, ask the students to take one of those cards there and write their answer. They don't have to give me their name. I just want to know their answer. Do they believe it matters? Or I might say to them, I want you to talk with your brothers and sisters right around you. Just get with two or three other people, and I want you to talk with them. Does it matter that baptism is by immersion? And then I want to hear their answers. And I don't know what kinds of answers you will get from your students. In fact, help me out here a minute. If you're just asking the question, you're just asking the question, what kinds of answers do you think you might get from your students? Would they say, yes, no, I don't know, maybe it does, I'm not sure? Just holler out for me. What kind of answer do you think you would get? All right, I hear some, some would say yes. <coughs> would they all say yes, do you think? Okay. So if they're not all saying yes, what else might they say? Some would say, I don't know. Some, you say, would say, no, it doesn't matter. Okay. All right, good. We want them to go there, Yes. And that's where we want to take them. But part of what we're doing is simply asking the question. And there, this is where, as professors, we have to learn to ask a question and be quiet. Because all we're asking right now is, tell me what you think. And if, if a student answers with a response that we know is just wrong... Our tendency as professors is to launch into the correction. Sometimes all we need to do in this kind of approach that I'm arguing for is just let the students answer. And then that allows me to step into, I thank you for your honest answers. It's obvious in this room, we don't all agree on the answer to that question. So here's what we're going to do. Let's go to the Bible and let's see what the Bible says. So it allows me to do biblical teaching, it allows me to do theology of the ordinances, and it allows me to do so knowing that there are students in this room that I may have to help them really see what the Bible says. There are those who bring different backgrounds to the table that influence how they understand the question, and all I've done is I've asked a simple question. I, I might ask a question if I'm teaching evangelism. I might, I might simply ask this question. What obstacles do you think you will face if you are trying to share the gospel with a Muslim? What kind of obstacles do you think you will face if you are trying to share the gospel with a Muslim? Now again, help me out here. You tell, how would you answer that question? From your own experiences, what kind of obstacles do you think you would face if you were trying to share the gospel with a Muslim? All right, so what he already is holding on to differing beliefs. Okay, it's misconceptions about who we are and what we believe. And in particular, Jesus as the Son of God a number of different things. What other? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the whole question of Jesus as the Son of God. Now, one of the things I want you to see is if I ask that question, we may have students in the room who have had these opportunities and faced these obstacles. 
So they can speak to us out of experience to say, all right, this is what I experienced. Now I'm learning something about my students, that there are some in the room who have had the experience. There may be others in the room who have never tried to share the gospel with a Muslim, and this is all new information to them. But what, I, what I'm doing in asking the question is I'm learning about my students, I'm letting my students answer the questions a little bit ahead of time, and it allows me to think about, I know what content I want to cover, I know where that fits in our curriculum, but I'm reminded that I'm teaching these people in this room. And so by asking questions, before I answer them, I'm inviting them into the discussion. And if that's hard to do in, in getting students to talk, and it's, I will tell you, even in my classes, uh, it is not always easy to get students to talk, to speak up. It's, it's hard in many cultures. And so often what I will do is I will ask them to, to get into groups of two or three, and they just talk to themselves. Sometimes I'll ask them to do that and ask them to write something on the card, and I'll read the card. And it's just a way to get feedback from them if they are uncomfortable doing so. I'll also tell you, every time somebody speaks up to, to answer a question, I, w I want to say thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister, for helping us think that through. That's Even if I disagree with the answer, I want to say thank you for being a part of this discussion because it facilitates what we're doing. So as I think about teaching people, and I want them involved in hearing how what we teach applies to their lives, learn to ask questions before you answer them. And give your students permission. Give them permission to say, I don't know. Help me to understand your culture some. In, in my culture, some students are very comfortable saying, look, I don't have any idea. I don't know. But there are others who are very reticent. They're not very willing to say, I don't know, because that's embarrassing. In, in your culture, as you teach your students, will the, are they likely or not likely to answer, I don't, I don't know? Any of you teaching students who might be less willing to say, I don't know? Okay. Sometimes I think we have to give them permission to say, I, it's okay to say, I don't know, because you are here to learn. And it's okay for us to say, there are questions that I can't answer. You will, you will ask me questions that I don't know the answer. So that when we're willing to say, I don't know, then we know this is a place for us to teach. Okay. They're not going to say anything. Okay. All right. And I may, in my classroom, I may say, I understand some of you are very quiet. I know you're thinking about this. You're wondering about this. Thank you. Uh, let's just keep learning together. And it's helping draw them in and saying, I recognize that you're in this room, even if you're quiet. So there's number one. Number one is to learn to ask questions before what? Before you answer them. All right, here's, here's number two. I believe it was Liz that mentioned this yesterday, and Trevor may have talked about this as well, or Liz earlier today. Use, use case studies. Even as exam questions. A case study is simply describing a scenario and asking a student, what would you do in this situation? Let me give you just a couple of simple examples here. If I, if I were teaching a class on theology, I might write a simple case study that is really just a couple of sentences. And here it is. You are talking with a neighbor who questions whether Jesus is the Son of God. You're talking with a neighbor who questions whether Jesus is the Son of God. How would you answer him from the Bible? And I might add to this, if I'm teaching not just theology, but church history as part of it, how would you answer this from church history? 
how has the church answered this question? Or I might separate that depending on the class. If it's a church history class, I might simply ask the question, how has the church answered this question? And here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get him to think about, all right, I have neighbors, first of all. There are people in my life that I need to think about reaching. And those neighbors might ask me questions, and I need to think about how am I going to answer the question. So I'm putting him in a scenario where he has to think about how do I respond to this neighbor. And we might have to help him think through this. He may respond with an answer that only you as the professor understand because he's using theological terms that nobody else will ever understand. And you might have to help him see that, yes, you've answered that correctly, but let's also talk about how you might state that to your neighbor. And it's a simple case study. It's just a simple scenario that says, here's the situation. What would you do here? Let them determine what they would do. Here's a, here's a second one, a second case study. A young believer in your church tells you that he feels called to preach. A young believer in your church tells you that he feels called to preach. You're his pastor. And here are some of my questions I would want this young pastor to consider. Do you, as his pastor, have any say in whether or not this young man is called to preach? The question there really is, what role do you play as a pastor in helping a young man determine whether or not he is called to preach? And a follow-up question might be, how do you help him determine whether or not he really is called to preach? And so the student in answering this question, and sometimes we have to help them think this through, what kinds of issues are here? He has to think through, what is the role of the church here? What is a calling? How do we determine callings? What is the role of the pastor in this? And so you're just setting up simple scenarios to say, here's something you might face in ministry. What are you going to do here? Now, in a minute, I want to give you some, some simple case studies that I've heard from my students. But let's talk about where you might find case studies. Most of the time, if we're honest, you don't have to make these up. Why not? Because we're all living the case studies. So if you want to find out some good case studies and you want to involve local pastors in what you're doing, you're partnering with churches, ask some local pastors, what are you facing in your church and you don't know what to do? You don't know how to handle that situation. And you would give us permission without breaking confidences or without getting himself in an awkward position. You would give us permission in our class to talk about this and try to help you come up with a solution. Or another way you find a case study, if your students are pastoring, tell them to write them. Give them an assignment. Your assignment is to bring to us one scenario in your church, and you're trying to figure out what to do. And so they write it up. You talk about it as a class. You think about it biblically, theologically, practically. And then you help each other to think about how what you're doing in this classroom helps you do ministry together. That's what a good case study will do. When you ask your students about situations in their churches, only God knows what you might hear because people are people everywhere. I think about some of the situations that my students have given me. Let me just give you some of those. Maybe these are only what we face in our churches, but a student who is trying to figure out how to remove a leader in his church who is not doing his job well. Do you face any such things? A, a student who's trying to help a church member who has confessed to him that he is dealing with same-sex attraction. And this young preacher is trying to figure out, how do I shepherd him? Or a young pastor who is dealing with a church member who is stirring up trouble. 
creating division. Does that ever happen in your churches? <laughs> or I have, a, I have a student, a doctoral student, whose, whose church, he's dealing with a lot of people who are coming to his church as attenders. They are guests, but they are never making a commitment to Jesus. They're very faithful to be a part of the worship service, but they're never crossing the line to say they want to follow Christ. And he's asking the question, what do we do here? Maybe you face that. Or a young student who has had a five-year-old come to him saying he wants to be baptized. And this young pastor is trying to figure out how much does this five-year-old understand. And These are real live issues. And sometimes your students bring the live issues with them. We've just not allowed them to bring them into the classroom like we could, in my opinion. Case studies really help there. All right, so that's number two. Second process, use case studies. Here's number three. Practice reinforcing the material. Practice reinforcing the material. One of the ways to do that is what I did earlier in this session, and that's just to stop and ask, what has most caught your attention? In all of my classes, if I'm teaching an all-day-long class, every time we take a break, I'll come back and ask the question, what was most important to you? What caught your attention in the previous hour? If the class meets one day and then we meet again the next week, or it's every day, I'll come back the next day and I will say, tell me what caught your attention, what are you thinking about, what was most helpful to you the previous day or last week. And the reason I do that is I want students to constantly think about what we're giving them in the classroom is not just for the classroom. Now there are other reasons why that's important to me. You're, you're all educators. Think with me about that. Why would it be helpful to me to know what was most important to the students? Why would, why would that help me as a professor? What do you think? All right, it lets me know where I connected with them and where I answered some of their questions. And sometimes, and you know this as professors, sometimes that wasn't my major point. Sometimes what they remembered most and what helped them most is a story that I told on the side. And I learned, all right, that story really does help. Some of you have talked to me about my, my message yesterday morning, and part of what helped you was my telling the story about my brother. Because the story connected with your lives. And that was an illustration to make a point, but the story is what connected with you. And sometimes we assume that what we've taught and what we intend to be the most important is exactly what our students hear and what they take home. And the truth is, we may be teaching over here and they're hearing over here. What I'm arguing for is, it's our job as professors to find out where they are. And maybe something that was most important to them that wasn't most important to us, maybe I need to elevate that when I teach that lesson again. Or sometimes I've had a student say something, he said, this is what was most important to me, and what he said, I hope, wasn't even close to what I taught. Uh, because he heard something that it was, it came from a different universe. Um, but he was in the same room listening to me, which means somehow I did not connect with him. And somehow I either left the wrong impression or he only misheard me. But even if he misheard me, he just publicly told us how he misheard me. So what's my job now as a professor? It's to help correct him gently. It's to say, all right, my brother... I hope I didn't say it that way. So let's back up and make sure we get that right. That's what I mean by stopping and asking for feedback. You're reinforcing everything you're teaching while you're doing that. Another way to, to reinforce what you're teaching 
is to use one of these cards again. Let me give you another way to use the card. I'm not going to require you to do it right now, but let me give you another way to do this. At the end of your class period, just before you finish, you've got five minutes left. Here's the assignment for your students. I want you to write on this card what was most confusing to you or what you would like for us to talk about more the next time that we gather. Now that's one way to approach it. Another way to approach it is to ask the question I asked before. Write on your card, please, what was most helpful to you. The reason I ask, again, you tell me, why would I ask, tell me what was most confusing to you? Because I want to teach them, not impress them, I want to teach them. And so if they say to me, if the majority of the class says to me, I really did not understand what you meant by that church growth principle, that tells me that my job as a teacher is to come back the next day and say, let's go back here. Many of you said to me, that was confusing to you. Thank you for being honest with me. Let's do it one more time. So if I don't do that, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to keep teaching, assuming they know the foundation, and I'm going to find out later on that they missed everything after the foundation because I taught beyond them. Does that, does that make sense? And so it's a real simple way. Students get used to this after a while. They begin thinking, wow, I didn't get that, so I need to, I need to write that on my card. And it's a way for you to get feedback from them every time you teach, and you can go back and, and reinforce. That's what I want us to think about. Another way to reinforce things is to build into your syllabus. And I would love to see this. If I were king for a day, I would require this. In every syllabus for every class, I would require some assignment that requires the student to do something with the information. Sometimes it might be as simple as your assignment is to talk to a friend about what you learned about Christology today, about Christ today. And I want you to record what questions he has based upon what you've taught him. I want you to take 15 minutes and teach him. And I want you to record what questions he has. And you come back to class, tell me what questions he has so we can talk about what are your friends asking about Jesus. I would want to think about, all right, what kind of assignments can I give that say, you're going to take this home and you're going to figure out how to apply this in your ministry? That's, that's reinforcing. That's reinforcing. That's stopping and asking and showing them how to make use of what they're learning. That's the application point that's really important to me. All right, so what's principle number three or, or, or practice number three? Practice what? Reinforce the material. Right, here's number four. Let's move through this quickly. Here's number four. Use simple, active strategies to teach. Use simple, active strategies to teach. And sometimes they really are simple. That's why I gave you index cards to work with. Even if you don't have index cards, you can use slips of paper to do exactly what we've done. Let me show you a couple different ways to use the index cards. One, I already said at the beginning of the semester, you're asking the question, tell me what you really want to make sure we address. You could do that throughout the term. If you know you're going to deal with some topic, you might ask, tell me what you believe about X. You find out where people are, and you begin to address that. Here's another way to use these cards, and I credit one of my colleagues for doing this. When I do this in the States, I actually give students three different color cards, yellow, red, and green, like our stoplights. Green means go, red means stop, yellow means caution. But I'm going to do it differently with you because you only have two colors. I'm going to list some words for you. Assume we're in a teaching class, a higher education class. I'm going to list some terms for you. All right? I'm going to give you three of them just for practice. Here's what I want you to do. 
make sure I've got my colors right here. If you are convinced that you know exactly what this term means, I want you to hold up your green card, all right? So green means, yes, I got it. And if I ask you what the term means, you'll be able to give it to me, all right? If you're pretty sure you don't know what it means, and that's okay, you're pretty sure you don't know what it means, I want you to hold up the blue card, all right? So blue means, nope, help me, all right? And then if you think you might know, but you prefer I not ask you, I want you to hold up both cards. That's the yellow card, all right? All right, so what's the green card mean? All right, I got it. What's the blue card mean? I don't know. You hold up both. What, what's that mean? I think I do, but help me. All right, so let me just give you three terms. I'm thinking if I'm teaching a, an education class. Here's the first term. Formative assessment. Formative assessment. I want you just to just give me a response. If you're pretty sure you know it, that's green. If you don't know it, you're pretty sure that that's blue. If maybe you know it, but you're not sure, give me both cards. Hold your cards up for me. All right, hold them up. Keep them up so I can see them. All right, now, what am I doing as a professor here? I'm looking around to see how many of my students are certain they know this term. Here's what I see. If you're in my class, here's what I know. I need to teach this term. Now, some of you think you know, but you're not sure. Some of you are, seem sure. Some of you are pretty sure you don't know. All right, let's go to the second term. Summative assessment. Summative assessment. Same thing. You're sure you know it, it's green. You're sure you don't know it, it's blue. Maybe it's both cards. Let me see your cards again. Hold them up so I can see them. All right. Thank you. All right, here's the third term. Reflective assessment. Reflective assessment. All right, let me see your cards. All right. All right, now, before I give you what those terms mean, tell me how this is helpful. This simple strategy that's nothing than handing, but handing out some cards. What does that do for me as a professor? What do I learn? Feedback. I've got feedback right now. Yeah. Immediate feedback for where you think you are as students. Why else is this a helpful way to do this? Any other reason this is a helpful way to do it? All right, so now I've, now I've got these terms in front of them, and they're at least thinking, all right, I don't know those terms. I suspect we're going to get to them, and we, and we will. Any other reason this is helpful? Non yeah, I'm not putting anybody on the spot here. Now, I will tell you what will happen is sometimes students will, they'll, they'll barely lift their card. And some of you did that too, by the way. Some of you hid your cards behind the person seated in front of you. Uh, because sometimes we, we're, and we're watching, we're looking around to see who else is holding his card up. Make sure everybody else is holding their card up, then if, then if mine matches theirs, I'll put it up. I know we, oh, we do it in every culture. But it really is non and you can, you can have fun with that. You can, you can learn a lot about your students doing it that way. Let me give you definitions. I'm going to give you one other thing you can do with the cards, and I'm, then I'm done. Here are the definitions, just so you know. The formative assessment is assessing students along the way in a class. A quiz, for example, would be formative assessment. I'm learning what you're learning along the way. An assignment could be formative assessment. So I'm learning, are you grasping the concepts? And what formative assessment does is it helps me to know if everybody fails my quiz, then that means I haven't taught them well or my quiz was a terrible quiz. Either way, it means I have to back up and I know that now. Summative assessment would be what? If formative is along the way, what's summative? It's the end of the semester. Now I'm, I'm getting that final evaluation. Reflective assessment is what the professor does. It's when you and I step away from a class and we ask, what worked, what didn't work, what would we do differently? We reflect on what we've done in order to be better professors the next time we teach. Let me give you one more simple way to use the cards. 
I do this in a higher education course for PhD students that are made up of PhD students who are in all different disciplines. I take 28 cards and I write on one side of the card one story from each chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Just one story from each chapter. I mix them all up and I tell these PhD students, put them in order from the Gospel of Matthew. From chapter 1 to chapter 28. And the whole group gets to do it together. What do you think happens? You think they figure it out easily? No, they don't. Here's what I, and I've been doing this a long time. Here's what I learned, and they learn this too. They know the Gospel of Matthew through the Sermon on the Mount. They know the front through chapter 7, and they know chapter 28. <laughs> Everything else in between, they don't know. And, and here's what happens. All of the New Testament PhD guys, I watch them fade into the back of the crowd because they don't know it either. And then I ask them, all right, and I've watched them figure out how to do it. Some of them lay the cards on the floor. Some of them put the cards on the board. They figure out some creative way to do it. They try to help each other. They, they then figure it out and say, you know what? Here's what we conclude. I don't know the Gospel of Matthew very well. <laughs> well, I didn't have to teach them that. All I did is fill out some cards. Some of you can do this. You're teaching church history. You put the errors in order. You put names in order. You're teaching books and authors. You, you, you vary those. There are so many different simple things you can do that will allow your students to learn what they do know and don't know, have fun at the same time, and they will remember. I promise you, my students, my PhD students who work through the Gospel of Matthew that way, they remember that they've got a long way to go in knowing what the Gospel of Matthew is about. All right, is that helpful? Remember this, you're, you're teaching people, and you have the greatest, we have the greatest opportunity to invest in lives. So do it for God's glory. Just make sure you're teaching. All right, my time is up. Let me, let me, let me pray for us, and I don't see, there's Kevin back there. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for these men and women. Thank you for the privilege of teaching God, make us followers of you who so walk with you that if our students saw our lives every day, every minute, we would change nothing because we love you. Father, help us to take something, something home that will help us to be better professors, that our students may learn more and do something with it for your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen.